<laughs> this manga reads backwards. It's wild. Anyway, pretty quiet year in the old wrestling sphere, huh? Pretty much business, business as usual. Usual. Hang on, hang on. This runtime looks a little bit long to me. Some serious stuff must have gone down in 2022. Transformer tattoo toting blondie Cody Rhodes switched allegiances and transformed himself back into a WWE superstar. Leaking bucket in air, Jordan Shane McMahon took a stab at booking the Royal Rumble and he absolutely killed it. His career, I mean. In potentially the biggest Vince McMahon news of the year, he wrestled at WrestleMania against longtime rival Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like a Tory cabinet minister, two weeks into their job, Stephanie McMahon quietly stepped away from WWE. We'll never know why. In potentially the biggest Vince McMahon news of the year, he came under investigation for hush money payments to cover up an affair with a legal aide. Wrestling's prodigal son, CM Punk, completed his redemption journey at Double or Nothing, winning the AEW World Championship and also breaking his foot, jumping into the crowd to celebrate. It's hobbling time. In potentially the biggest Vince McMahon news of the year, we're filming this in early December, there's still time. Vince officially retires from his position as WWE CEO. Nick Khan, Stephanie Man and Triple H formed the new creative Cerberus to lead the company. AEW All Out passes without incident. Does it bollocks? CM Punk and his dog Larry get themselves into a backstage brawl with Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. Everyone is suspended and forced to vacate their newly won titles. William Regal turned the Blackpool Combat Club into the Cockpool Combat Cuck as he turned his back on them to help MJF win the AEW World Championship and then promptly left the promotion to rejoin WWE. And then things got wibbly wobbly, boss timey wimey as it appeared that Sasha Banks would never return to WWE after her and Naomi's walkout on Raw was done with wrestling, then for five minutes might have been coming back to WWE and then was going to wrestle elsewhere in 2023. And then also a bunch of Vince McMahon how did that get in here? So yeah, this is a new thing we're gonna do. We're gonna send 2022 home in style with a recap of all the biggest and most controversial news stories of the year. We're gonna put the year in a headlock. We're gonna soften it up with a few blows and we're gonna bust it open to see what spills out. Now look, I know, no, no, I know I said, I know I said act along with the video, but like if you bleed, we're gonna get demonetized and YouTube doesn't like that. Ollie doesn't like that. So you put that down, put that down. What's in your mouth? What? In January, WWE blessed us with two premium live events. Firstly, day one kicked off the month with a kick to the dick of fans of Big E's WWE title reign by crowning hot new young up-and-comer Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar beats a member of the New Day for the WWE Championship. How do they come up with this stuff? And I mean, it didn't quite sit right with wrestling fans because Lesnar was only airlifted into the match after his scheduled opponent, Roman Reigns, contracted COVID. Makes sense though, because otherwise he'd have nothing to do, would he? What, what else would he get up to? Hunt and kill a deer, butcher it and eat it. Pfft. Thankfully though, it wasn't all doom and gloom as January was also rumble season, the most wonderful time of the year. Because the great thing about the rumble is it always delivers. Lead writer and producer and human showerhead Shane McMahon subjected us all to 51 minutes of mid-carders barely interacting to build up suspense for the greatest wrestling return of 2022, Shane McMahon. Shane O'Mac went to bat against the final four of Bad Bunny, Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar, who after a pretty uneventful month was finally rewarded with something big to do, like winning the Rumble. You see, off of the chance to saw, Thickerus had flown too close to the sun. His awful booking left him with a substantial amount of heat backstage, which melted the waxen wings that held him so high in the WWE hierarchy and also explains the sweat, I guess. Shane came down to earth with a bump after it was revealed that he had essentially tried to book the entire rumble around himself. He'd openly buried fellow producer Jamie Noble and attempted to fight everyone backstage. I mean, basically he was mad on power and just using his position in the company to tell wrestlers to do stuff to make him look good. Now cry. 
Oh yeah, I'm so strong. For his troubles, Calamity Shane was quietly let go by WWE, despite having been planned to appear at both Elimination Chamber and WrestleMania 38. He was replaced by Austin Theory in the match at Elimination Chamber, and also in his father Vince's heart, as Theory seemingly became the latest in a long line of chosen ones. Come here, boy. You will be my new son. Better in every way. Much bigger trainers. Now watching all of this from afar with a sense of longing was Tilda Swinton tribute act Cody Rhodes, whose three-year contract with AEW expired, and after literally setting himself on fire to zero applause, thought, you know what, Fuck this, I'm going back to the place where my family has been given the respect it deserves. So suddenly, the Optimus Prime of suboptimal storylines was a free agent while still the company's TNT champion, dropping this Megatron bomb in a YouTube promo. There's so many elephants in the room. This is an insane week in wrestling. People think that the Sean Ross story is BS, it's not. I am working here without a contract. I'm not even on payroll anymore. I'm working here on a handshake deal. With so many elephants, no wonder Cody didn't think there was room for him in AEW. But according to reports, Cody's bigger concern was how much were the elephants being paid and was he being paid as much? Turns out he wasn't, so he packed his trunk and trundled off to Vince's circus. You see, Cody thought that he was being paid peanuts, which, you know, the elephants were happy about, but you don't get the same mileage out of them as a human man. I actually have a rather serious peanut allergy. This visual metaphor is incredibly dangerous. I need to wash my hands. So Cody Rhodes and Tony Khan have been apparently locked in frantic negotiations for six weeks trying to agree a new deal, and everyone just assumed that Cody would relent and be under contract in no time. I mean, what are you doing? You were supposed to tap out there. You're just holding my hands. Don't start this shit with me. But by the time that February rolls around, Cody is officially AE done with AE dub. A new report saying that part of their issue was Tony taking over the booking of the show as Cody saw it as a chance to pay homage to his father. Which frankly makes a lot of sense because Cody had been locked in multiple rights and trademark battles with WWE over stipulations and shows that his father had created during his career. So clearly, he thought, if you can't beat them, join them. And that way, when they destroy your family legacy, you're just sort of there. Powerless to stop it and forced to watch. Look, I'm not saying he's masochistic, but the guy did set himself on fire when literally no one asked him to. Turns out that Cody's not the only one who can let a contract quietly expire because Swiss Superman Cesaro let his own contractual battle with Flex Luther Vince McMahon end in stalemate and decided to up and leave WWE in February. Because it turns out that Cesaro's kryptonite is just being incredibly undervalued in the workplace. It's like if the Justice League were like, we know you're good at your job, you're essentially invulnerable, you can shoot lasers out of your eyes and you're a, an all-round well-liked guy, but this guy, this guy's got dangerous interpersonal issues and he's rich and he's American, not from stupid space like you. Wherever that is. Cesaro turned out to be AEW bound, where he would join the likes of Keith Lee, who had debuted in February, as would the Brian Kendrick, if the Illuminati hadn't got involved. Because Kendrick was announced for a match with John Moxley on AEW Dynamite, but comments he made in interviews in 2011 and 2013 resurfaced. These touched on things such as the moon being a hollow space station for aliens, reptilian people being the global elite who live underground, the sun not actually being hot, and the Holocaust not actually happening. And this led to Tony Khan over here, deciding to pull the plug on the entire thing and just organize a match with Wheeler Utah instead. Because why not? You see, it's all connected. Just to give you an example of the sort of thing that he was saying, here he is talking about Haiti post-earthquake. Uh, the Jewish medics already being flown to Haiti uh, uh, within minutes after the earthquake, prepared, ready to go. Um, not, I'm not saying the medics were in on it, but I'm saying the, Zion, the uh, Zionists who run things were there to scoop up the, uh, the, the body parts. They were there to take eyeballs, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, I have some news for you, Mr. The Kendrick. Now, Brian would later apologize on Twitter saying, I apologize for all of the hurt and embarrassment I have caused with my words. These are not my beliefs and never were my beliefs. Oh, these beliefs? I oh, no, they're not my beliefs. I'm just... I'm just, I'm holding them I'm hot for a friend. Yeah, for a friend. I was, I was just, you know, trying them out, see what they were like while I had them. I don't, I don't actually, you wouldn't, no, no, you wouldn't think that I, no, you can't think that, you wouldn't, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that I actually, no, I, I don't, because not me, I, I believe that. 
I mean, 9-11 was an inside job, though. March rolled in and brought with it confirmation that Stone Cold Steve Austin would be crawling out of his mud hole for one more match, despite not having wrestled in 19 years. I mean, Stone Cold promised to open up one last can of whoop ass on Kevin Owens, who had invited him to be a guest on his WrestleMania edition of the KO Show. Oh, goody, everyone said. A talk show. This is going to be a great WrestleMania. Cheers. Ah. Oh. oh, this whoop ass has gone off. Oh, it says used by March 2003. All right, this also beans. Somebody else with a delicate palate, Triple H, or ha 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 ha, to use his full name, also returned to work after a cardiac event in September 2021 forced him to take time out. Now, here's a little bit of an exclusive, because we've actually got hold of the car that WWE sent Triple H while he was in his local medical facility. It says, get well soon. We fired everyone you love which they did. It's kind of like coming back to work from a holiday and finding out they moved your desk while you were away. What a prank. And they've also taken all your friends outside to be shot. It's Mr. Bump, because wrestling. So not only did Hunter return to work to find out that his role had been drastically diminished, his close confidence ousted, and his black and gold baby spewed up all over itself and was gleefully rolling around in the multicolored spew, but he also was forced to retire from in-ring action. So in an interview of ESPN's first take, Papa H just sort of quietly let slip that he'll never be able to return to in-ring action. He said, as far as in-ring, which I get a lot, I'm done. I won't. I would never wrestle again. First, I have a defibrillator in my chest, which is probably not a good idea for me to get zapped on live TV. Game over. And the game was also paused for recent WWE Champion Big E after he broke his neck on a horrific botch, leaving everyone unsure when or even if he would return to the ring. Across the divide in AEW, Tony Khan was hyping yet another huge announcement. And this time it wasn't just a wrestler who was going to come in, cause a stir, make an appearance for a couple of weeks before the next Golden Goose came in. That sounded a bit cynical. Was that a bit cynical? Now, what do you guys know? Now, you have to remember that this was during the peak time that AEW booking was essentially Tony Khan going, look at all my sh**. Like a sort of divorced parent trying to buy our love. TK trotted out signee after signee in order to boost the ratings for Dynamite Rampage in the pay-per-views. Now, I know you feel like I've abandoned you, but what about if I got you a Samoa Joe? You haven't got one of those at home. So you'd have to come round to mine to play with it. But it turned out that rather than just padding his already bloated roster, Tony decided to just buy an entirely different roster as it was revealed that he had agreed to purchase independent promotion, Ring of Honor. So after sensibly cancelling most of their shows throughout the pandemic, ROH ended up on hiatus. Because that's where your morals will get you in 2022. Which actually left them ripe for the buyout. In a deal on handshakes said to be somewhere between 20 to 40 million dollars, TK netted a brand new roster of stars, pay-per-views, and most importantly, a video library spanning 20 years. The new Ring of Honor basically just became absorbed into regular AEW programming though, with matches under the Code of Honor and belts being defended on weekly TV and pay-per-views. So really what's happened that is instead of buying another the brand where he can send his huge roster of talent off to compete. He's added another roster to that already bloated roster and he's now just trying to cram all of them into the same three hours of television every single week. Does anyone else need a piss? Can you name every wrestler Tony Khan hired this year? Every wrestler Tony Khan hired this year. The guy that Jet. oh my god it's literally happened today. Uh, that Austin guy who just won their match against Chris Jericho. Awesome Andretti? Uh, b b b Action Andretti? Action Andretti. AR Fox. Austin Henderson. Yeah, that's his name. Claudio Castagnoli. Soraya. Renee Paquette. Does Renee count? I have been in the room for everyone else's filming of these segments, so I should be able to name every single wrestler Tony Khan I am. Are we talking AEW or Ring of Honor, guys? Think anyone he hired. Okay, the embassy. Action. And a, and a Terry. Oh my god, I can't believe I can't. Um, this year there was Keith Lee. There was Buddy Matthews. I've, I've been I've been laughing at people, correcting them. And a Telly. Matt Taver, Maria Canellis. Barney the fucking dinosaur. <laughs> Keith Lee this year. Dalton Castle. Boy one, boy A of Dalton Castle. Jeff Jarrett! How can I forget Jeff Jarrett? Um, hmm. Takeshita. We've got Soraya. We've got Claudio. Brody King. Uh, Bandito. 
Juice Robinson, Roosh. <laughs> Who else did he hire? Keith Lee. Keith Lee. <laughs> Was that this year? Yeah. Oh, okay. Keith Lee, Swerve then. Mm. Um, We've got Tony Storm, Athena. My husband, Keith Lee. Ring of Honor. AR Fox. All of Ring of Honor. Everyone in Ring of Honor. Jonathan Gresham was this year, briefly. Takeshita? Takeshita. Um, oh, there's loads more. Uh, Willow, Willow Nightingale. How many How many have I not got? Claudio. Can't forget about Samoa Joe, of course. Nope, all the names have gone. But I did better than Pete. William Regal. I'm out of names. <laughs> William Regal? William Regal! <laughs> William Regal! William Regal! <laughs> Arrived and gone in the same year. <laughs> William Regal! <laughs>April brought us the greatest show of them all. The showcase of the immortals. The 90s, but nowadays, but old, but surprisingly okay. Now wrestling fans are known to dine out in nostalgia like little piggies scuffing down slurry from the trough of history, though this was taken to a whole new level when both Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon wrestled on night one of WrestleMania. Yes, get that down you, you f***ing swine. Stone Cold broke the record for the longest time between WrestleMania main events, and he actually, he actually looked all right doing it. This man taking Stone Cold's stunner, however, crumbled like a rich tea biscuit having been freshly dumped into a lukewarm cup of tea. And that wasn't the only slow and ungraceful fall that Vince would be taking this year. Wink. But that wasn't the only person returning to WWE after a long hiatus this WrestleMania, as we saw four, which is even more a prescient analogy right now, because by this point, AEW seemed to have about 300 people on their roster. Our roster will blot out the sun. So yes, the rumours were true. The prodigal son had returned to face Hawk Couture Hyena Seth Rollins. EW2 WWE took place. But this defection was much bigger than any we had seen before. Cody is not just your everyday Jericho, Moxley, Danielson, Punk, Ruby Soho, Sting, Paul White, Mark Henry, Miro, Andrade, Vicky Guerrero, Malachi Black, Christian, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Pac, FTR, Soraya, Sean Spears, Jake Hager, Adam Cole, Athena, Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, Buddy Matthews, Keith Lee, Swerve Strickland, Matt Seidel, Serena Deeb, Billy Gunn, Leo Rush, Tony Storm, Johnny Elite, Dustin Rhodes, or Cody Rhodes. This was Cody Rhodes we were talking about, a founder of WWE's greatest rival in 20 years. Cody made it clear during his first month back and leading into May that what he was really after was a shot at the WWE Championship, a title his father had never won and one that he wanted to win in his honor. Father! Some might call it ego that drives a man to demand the title shot of the most prestigious championship in all of WWE based on name alone, but Cody in that moment seemed honest and humble, even if his head had proved too big to be contained by a WWE stage. Look guys, can you just get out actually? Cause I just kind of want this to all be about me. So if you could just, just go. Yeah, just, yeah, thank you. Just in your own time. Thanks, yeah. But the star man waiting in the stage wasn't the only prodigal wrestling son with a championship chip on their shoulder. CM Punk was also looking to complete his return journey by besting Adam Page for the AEW World Championship and cashing in his chip at double or nothing. I'm not entirely sure that the poker analogy completely works, but that's the thing about poker. You've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Punk, however, would struggle to do either of the final two suggestions as despite finally winning the world title and being back on the top of his game again, he managed to break his foot diving into the crowd to celebrate. Punk blew his load a little bit too quickly, get a little bit too excited on the old celebration and basically bringing what was gearing up to be another summer of Punk to a premature halt as he vacated the AEW Championship in order to go off and have surgery. Also vacant around this time was the seat of one Maxwell Jacob Friedman at a pre-double or nothing meet and greet. Despite having been booked for the event, MJF decided not to show up and nobody from the company was able to contact him. So yeah, MJF just ghosted Tony Khan. Like, 
his literal boss Sorry. and the guy paying his wages. Sorry. And all this became part of this ongoing rumor about MJF being unhappy to, uh, with AEW and his contracts and actively caught in office from outside, especially from WWE. And generally, just You've acting out in the meantime in order to get a better deal from TK. All right, cut, yeah, good. You, all right, we've got, we've got that? You, yeah, good, all right, that's probably lunch. It's probably lunch. Are you doing a bit? I'm, are you doing a bit because I'm the boss? I'm not the boss. One of the guys. Though MJF did remember how to get to work for double or nothing and subsequently got squashed in a powerbomb symphony by mountain of meat served in the man bun, Wardlow. Also not turning up to work in May were Sasha Banks and Naomi, who refused to take part in the main event of an episode of Raw after a reported issue with the booking and walked out, never to return for now. WWE obviously took it ever so graciously, having Michael Cole call the pair out for unprofessional conduct and letting down the entire WWE universe live on an episode of SmackDown. Now kids in glass houses, in glasses, shouldn't throw stones, Michael. Although realistically, Cole was just a puppet for Vince McMahon's own vitriol, out to prove a point that no woman was going to get the better of him this month. But Sasha and Naomi weren't the only women on their way out of the WWE door because the inventor of women herself was also going. Because also not turning up to work in May was Stephanie McMahon who did the corporate equivalent of updating her Facebook status to single, she updated her LinkedIn. From out of nowhere, Stephanie announced that she would be stepping away from WWE for the foreseeable, removing all reference to the company on her LinkedIn profile. Oh yeah, and also tweeting, as of tomorrow, I am taking a leave of absence from the majority of my responsibilities at WWE. WWE is a lifelong legacy for me and I look forward to returning to the company that I love after taking this time to focus on my family. But the craziest thing about all of this is that it just came out of the blue and it was said that very few people in WWE even knew that the move was coming. And even less knew after she put it on LinkedIn. Because who in the f*** uses LinkedIn? I mean, skywriting would have reached more people. Stephanie had been WWE's chief brand officer responsible for working with advertisers, media, business partners and investors to grow WWE's brand reputation and obviously is credited with the invention of women's wrestling, but we've already made that joke already. Now at the time, Wrestling Observer's Dave Meltzer noted that Steph wasn't forced or pressured out, but some people did speculate marital issues. Don't know why, they look so happy on their wedding day. You can really see the joy in her eyelids. But plenty of other reasons were touted and spread to media, like doubt on her and her abilities, according to Andrew Zarian, though ominously, Wade Keller of PW Torch said that the real reason was still to come and very private. Regardless, with Shane gone and Stephanie gone, that was two of Vince's Horcruxes. Now all we need to do is find five more. One was probably a black vest and the other four... Oh, they're probably bank statements. A wink. Vincent Kennedy McMahon had what can only be described as a mass hen event when all of his chickens came home to roost in June. A Wall Street Journal investigation found that Vince had previously paid a former employee three million dollars to keep quiet about their affair. So the head honchos of WWE then started out acting out their parts like it was the new series of Succession, as Stephanie returned to the company to take charge temporarily as interim CEO, so she had stepped away and then stepped back, cha-cha real smooth. Vince, meanwhile, decided wisely to appear live on an episode of SmackDown for no good reason other than to stoke his own ego and to let the world know that no woman was going to get the better of him. Until, of course, enough women combined all of their powers to bring him down like the sort of megazord of sexual misconduct allegations. Over in AEW, nothing so tawdry was going on. Instead, MJF and Tony Khan were just publicly sparring over money. Now, Tony Khan made the terrible mistake of handing a live microphone to MJF on Dynamite in the midst of this drama, which he promptly used to cut a pipe bomb promo calling TK a f***ing mark and asking him to fire him in no uncertain terms. This work slash shoot promo was made all the more delicious by the presence of Warner Bros Discovery executives who were said to be in attendance at the show. So there were some that thought the promo was a shoot, whereas others thought it was a work. And then it turned out that the pair had sat down to hash things out so that what was a shoot actually became a work. You tricksy little bastard wrestlers, you. Either way, MJF was pulled from AEW programming and barely mentioned on the product for months. It's a great storyline, so long as a bunch of real life things don't mimic it and make it seem like you've got serious issues backstage. Over in WWE land, Cody Rhodes' run was off to an inauspicious start after he injured himself training for a match at Hell in a Cell, which was in frickin' June, the scientifically least spooky month. January through March is cold, April has lambs, which cultists love. May is all pagan and shit. July and August, they're hot like the apocalypse. September and October, now these, that, 
That's your prime spook months there. November is pitch black at 4 p.m. And Santa is a creepy dude who comes into your house at night, so December is out, which leaves you June. This gave his run back with Seth Rollins some colour. That colour being f***ing purple. Look at the state of that. He's like half man, half Barney the dinosaur. He looks like he's halfway through in an everlasting gobstopper. He looks like he's transforming into shattered glass Optimus Prime. Now that, that is a deep cut. Not as deep as this though, this is painful. Regardless of the injury though, Cody and Seth managed to roll out an incredible match where the nurple of purple added some serious wince-inducing stakes. Finally, people were cheering Cody hurting himself for our amusement. And obviously, Rhodes had to go away and have surgery. Welcome back. July proved that sometimes you wait ages for a scandal to come along and fundamentally rock WWE to its core, and then two just come along at once as the Wall Street Journal published a follow-up article uncovering three more NDAs in Vince McMahon's past, allegedly covering up a litany of infidelity, sexual harassment, and misconduct, totaling $14.6 million in total payouts. And before all of this, it looked like Vince had been getting away with it too. Talk about a dusty finish. In fact, Vince had been so confident that it wasn't a big deal, folks backstage had said that he was essentially no selling the whole thing and just being defiant. Now, obviously, Vince had been forced to step back from his role as CEO, as had WWE head of talent relations John Laurinaitis, who was placed on administrative leave after it was revealed that Vince had allegedly passed one of the former employees he was having an affair with to Johnny Ace like a toy, using some weird perversion of the three bird rule. And somehow, Vince still retained full creative control of WWE. But all of this, while morally dubious, is not actually technically illegal. It's the fact that these hush money payments may potentially have used WWE funds, and the fact that it was alleged Vince doubled the salary of his legal aid after sleeping with her that the WWE board really needed to investigate. Again, it's not the fact that Vince was essentially abusing his position of power in the company to coerce younger women into having sex with an old man. Talk about a dusty finish because he's old. To truly show that he didn't care what anyone thought of him, Vince retired, announcing it in a simple statement that said, as I approach 77 years old, I feel it's time for me to retire as chairman and CEO of WWE. You know, I just feel like it's time for me to pack it all in. It's been, it's been calling to me, the idea, you know. I've always thought, whoa, oh, maybe I'll get, maybe I'll get an allotment, you know, get into gardening. I've always wanted to learn a bit more about that, get a bit green fingered. But that's the thing is, you know, I just, I feel it. I'm 77. I feel it in my bones. It's time to just, you know, take it easy. Put my feet up. Spend a bit more time with the wife. And any number of other women. It's mad because I think we all thought that Vince would die on the job just on an episode of Raw, probably rapidly aging up like he'd drunk from the wrong cup at the end of the last crusade before crumbling into a pile of protein powder. Talk about a dusty finish. Did you ever think that Vince McMahon would, would retire? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Do you know what's funny is when Vince McMahon retired, when he put out that tweet saying he was retired, I was going to do a live stream reaction to it on the podcast. And I turned to my wife and I said, don't believe him. Uh, I, I don't think he's actually going to retire. I think he's actually going to be running the company regardless. And it's just a, uh, a public facing retirement. I did think that Vince McMahon would retire, but from life. No, 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 I did not. Well, I don't want to self promote too much, but me and Luke do a year of predictions at the end of each year. And at the end of last year, predicting 2022, my big prediction was that when the Netflix documentary of Vince McMahon came out, it will be gushingly positive, a fluff piece to put over Vince McMahon the man. And that would create a backlash of people in the media, either journalists going to uncover stories that were lurking under the surface, or from people who had been wronged in some way by Vince McMahon or had accused him previously. And that would kind of create a Me Too backlash specifically towards Vince McMahon and that would blow up. No, I didn't think that Vince McMahon would ever retire. To quote his own theme song, I didn't think there was any chance in hell. Yes, I did. I, did he retire? Uh, no, it turns out he actually retired. I could have never thought that we would be looking at a WWE with an alive Vince McMahon on the outside looking in at Christmas time at the delicious feast that Triple H is booking for WrestleMania and just fogging up the windows, wanting to take part. If you had played the game Horizon Zero Dawn, 
Well, I imagine that in a thousand years, someone will be like kind of making their way, platforming up through WWE headquarters. And they'll go into a room and there'll be a giant Tyrannosaurus skull on the side. And they'll be like, oh, this must be from an ancient civilization. And they'll turn and look at the desk and find this sort of calcified husk clutching the desk and sort of fused to it because Vince McMahon will never, ever let WWE go. Amazingly, this, this great white whale was, uh, was taken down with a uh, simple harpoon of uh, consequences for his horrendous actions. Who knew that could do that? With Vince finally brought low by the dirt in his sheets, it fell to a new trifecta to take over the reins in WWE. After stepping away, stepping back, cha-cha real smooth, Stephanie McMahon would be stepping up from interim CEO to co-CEO alongside Nick Khan, and Triple H took over the role of head of creative. It's all about the game and how you play it. I play it long. I've been waiting ages. <laughs> Triple H said that he wanted working at WWE to be fun, and early reports suggested that morale under his reign was instantly boosted. I mean, it's almost as if you could trace many, many of the issues back to one man. And now that that man was gone, people could just concentrate on doing what they loved to the best of their ability. You lot better not be looking at me right now. If I turn around and you're not wrestling, I'm going to be very cross. August was Triple H's first real time to show off his vision for what WWE would become now that the eye of Sauron had been poked out and was no longer looking over his shoulder. Well, I guess in this case, it's a bit more like Sauron had jizzed in his own eye and then been done in by the SEC. But that is by the by, because Trips' vision was magnificent. It looked like... It looked like... I mean, it looked a lot like NXT. He just sort of brought back everyone from NXT that had been let go and who wasn't already working for AEW. Can you name every wrestler Triple H brought back this year? I think I might be able to do this. Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt, obviously the biggest one of them all. Obviously the biggest one, Dexter Loomis. Dexter Loomis. Man with the app. Dexter Loomis. <laughs> <laughs> Sullivan's just doing that off camera at me. Carrying Cross Scarlet. Braun Strowman. Dakota, <laughs> Jenny said Dakota Fanning. Dakota Kai. <laughs> Tegan Knox. We've got Emma. Mia Yim. Candice LeRae. Johnny Gargano. Um, uh, am I missing many? Hmm. Am I missing any? Who else? B Fab. Top Dollar. LA Knight was brought back from the dead. Tegan Knox. Uh, Scarlet. Bray. Dakota Kai. He really has gone for the mid card of NXT. <laughs> That's just Triple H's big master plan. I'm going to bolster the ratings and the main roster with the mid card of NXT because AEW signed all their top ones. We've got William Regal. William Regal? Do I get that? So everyone was off camera going, War Games! And I was like, oh, you brought back the concept of War Games, but what you mean is William Regal. <laughs> War Games! Who also signed for AEW this year? <laughs> <also> for AW <laughs> this year? <laughs> William Regal! <laughs> Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Triple H's rehiring spree saw Dakota Kai, Karrion Cross and Scarlet, Hit Row, Sun Swerve of course, Dexter Loomis, Johnny Gargano, Braun Strowman, Candice LeRae, Bray Wyatt, Gallows and Anderson, Emma and Tegan Knox all brought back into the fold over the course of five months. And Triple H being in charge also meant that some of Vince's more eccentric sports entertainment tastes no longer had to be adhered to. Matches no longer had to be sub five minutes. You didn't need to endlessly restart them around ad breaks. You didn't have to be sexually harassed backstage. That's a big one. Oh yeah, and you could finally call yourself a wrestler again on screen. Drew McIntyre drove this particular point home in a now iconic promo on Raw. Wrestler standing in front of another wrestler, asking him to wrestle. I think that means I want to Meanwhile, in AEW, five-star Shagger sticks in the Tokyo Dome. Sorry, I mean wrestler Kenny Omega returned to the company in triumphant fashion after a long absence due to injury. So Kenneth came back sporting a compression shirt and saying he was having three to four sessions of physical rehab a day to deal with a litany of issues, including a shoulder injury, a hernia, a problem with his knees, and vertigo. Oh, uh, help me down, um, please, help me down. Help me down! Help me, yep. Yeah. 
I said, it's fine, it's fine, please. You can, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Kenny joined up with the Young Bucks once more and quickly rose to dominance in the newly founded trios division, earning themselves a shot at the freshly unboxed championships at All Out. But trouble was brewing backstage at AE Dub with talent like Sonny Kiss, Ethan Page and the Varsity Blondes unhappy about how the roster bloat left them with little TV time, while others like Santana and Ortiz were pissed about their booking at the hands of Tony Khan and Eddie Kingston was unhappy with the human embodiment of Smug himself, Sammy Guevara, and got himself suspended for his troubles. Tony had loads on his plate though. Not only two full rosters of talent to book across four shows, but managing the owner and operator of the largest ego in wrestling, CM Punk, who returned to screens in August. And Punk had clearly spent most of his time off injured, just sort of stewing in his juices, and now he was absolutely marinated in malice. He went off script during a promo to set up his AEW Championship match against John Moxley at All Out to call out Hangman Page, who made the mistake of sticking to the script and therefore couldn't answer something which wasn't supposed to be in the show. The coward. Punk did this over some sort of beef with Hangman Page because of comments that Hangman Page alluding to CM Punk's real life beef with former best friend Colt Cabana during their championship program. But at some point, you gotta think if you're producing this much beef, are you not just the butcher? Or like a cow? Or like a Lady Gaga dress made of beef that people keep just sort of peeling bits off of and then getting cross about? I'm saying, I'm saying it's probably Punk's fault. And with Punk the top guy wobbling, TK's house of cards seemed like it was all crumbling down. But I mean, thank God there wasn't some sort of high pressure scenario coming up like a pay-per-view. Thank God. Talk about bits you write before you know you can do them. Never mind building a house of cards, can't make a bungalow out of cards. September started strong for AEW, but also started wrong, as their all-out pay-per-view thrilled audiences with amazing matches, the return of MJF, finally putting rumours of backstage troubles to rest, and the re-coronation of the best in the world, CM Punk as AEW world champion. Long may he reign! But nobody knew that shit and fan were poised to meet in such spectacular fashion backstage. Oh. Drama. But then world-renowned tongue biter CM Punk chomped so hard on his during a post-pay-per-view press conference that it came off and while writhing around in a bloody mess on the table said all of these awful things. Punk aired his grievances like a bomber airs napalm, going for a sort of scorched earth strategy that burned the likes of Hangman Page, Colt Cabana because of course it did, and the Young Bucks who he described as irresponsible people who call themselves EVPs and who couldn't f***ing manage a target. This obviously riled up the Bucks and led to a backstage brawl between Punk, his trainer Ace Steel, and the elite in a locker room, a ruckus which was very different depending on who you asked. Can you explain the all out brawl situation to the best of your ability? Right. Okay, so the All Out Brawl, um, to sum that up in just a few words in the most objective way possible because it's a very tribalistic sided bit of news this year, is that CM Punk is right. So CM Punk had this muffin. I think it was mostly about muffins. CM Punk was annoyed. CM Punk is a very grumpy man. Because Hangman Page in a promo months before brought up stuff that he didn't like. It was all about workers' rights and how CM Punk has meant the opposite of that since he's gotten here. Cole Cabana and Hangman Page are obviously the same faction. He like called out Adam Page at some point and, and sort of waited for him in the middle of the ring even though Adam Page was not even at the show. So then in All Out, he becomes the champion, but in the process, Adam Page makes him very sad. And CM Punk wins the AEW World Championship and he does a press conference. And said, I don't like Hangman and a bunch of other people in this company, and they all suck. He called Hangman Page an empty headed dumb f, which wasn't very nice. CM Punk is always right. CM Punk was correct in saying what he had to say. Everyone there are babies! CM Punk was like, my mum made these muffins for everyone. And Tony Khan was like, everyone, come and have some of CM Punk's mum's muffins. And then the muffin fueled him to have a pop at a journalist because this journalist knew Colt Cabana. Because CM Punk said that he was gonna pay for Colt Cabana's legal, uh, legal fees and everything, and he didn't want to do that. Ace Steel was like, I love these muffins. He said to this journalist, so you're friends with Colt Cabana, and the journalist said, not really. And Colt Cabana was like, and he was like, well, f Colt Cabana, and here's another thing about him. Hangman Page shouldn't have said what he did. Look at Hangman Page, he's so selfish all the time. The elite were like, 
Ah, oh, you got Colt Cabana demoted. I don't want your muffins. But they just knocked on the door and then they all fought. And, they, and then he uh, they had a big fight. And there was a dog and he, maybe he got bitten. Kenny Omega. And then a dog got hit. And a dog got sad as well. His dog got sad. A Steel bit Kenny Omega. A big fight broke out and the dog got saved. And then they got, all got suspended. It's an investigation and then all the belts were gone. We had, to, we had to get new champions. And the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, they just employ their friends. Nobody looked good coming out of it. Oh, it was bad. Hung over AW for months, that did. It ruined everything. And everyone hated Dynamite for like two months. And then Ace Steel killed Kenny Omega by beating him to death with CM Punk's dog. I don't watch a lot of AEW. I'm glad he got bit. With the fallout of the brawl swamping all other news from All Out, like if the final fight from Avengers Endgame just cut to Wolverine chopping Deadpool into tiny little bits for calling his mama a hussy instead, I mean, it's all you talk about, Tony Khan made the very wise decision to suspend everyone involved, except Punk's dog Larry, of course. Because he is the goodest of boys. But this meant that CM Punk would have to step away from his AEW Championship for the second time, just days into his reign. And those titles the Elite just won, well, they were up for grabs too. What are you guys, what are you, what are you guys doing? We're on strike. <laughs> yeah. You haven't even got a union. With four top guys suddenly on suspensions and Chewy Chewy Bad Guy Ace Steel out of the door for supposedly having nibbled Kenny Omega mid-fight, many were left wondering where AEW goes from here. Meanwhile in WWE... I mean, what a say, really. Uh, Crash of the Castle was quite good. Solo Sokoa joined the bloodline. October, the scariest month, except January for freelancers, of course, saw Bray Wyatt return to WWE at Extreme Rules' premium live event, Spoopy. The second coming of Bracis also heralded the start of a spooky new storyline involving an ethereal door and mysteriously meat-faced Uncle Howdy, who seemed to be goading a reformed Bray into doing bad things once more. What do you think is going on with Uncle Howdy? I'm honestly a bit lost about all the things. I think it's almost gotten too cryptic. I don't really know much about the guy uh, other than he looks odd. He looks like a Mighty Boosh character. It's been three months and I still don't feel like we're really any closer to figuring out what is happening with this character. Uncle Howdy looks like if the KFC Colonel drowned. I think that's what's going on with Uncle Howdy. Maybe we don't need, need that many layers to characters. Maybe that's too many layers. And it seems pretty, pretty, pretty aimless at the moment. Uncle Howdy has like an earring that's in one shot and it's the same earring that Bo Dallas would wear. Uh, a guy who just really likes greeting people. What's a, what I, <laughs> I don't know. That'll be it. That's the whole story. Then Bray Wyatt goes away again. Oh, Bray Wyatt. That's another person that Triple H brought back. <laughs> as far as I know, he's just a weirdo. Um, much like most uncles. Meanwhile, over in AEW with Chief Mischief Makers the Elite and Punk serving time in the sin bin, it was all quiet, was it, bollocks? Because instead, a Twitter spat erupted between Andrade El Idolo and Spanish god Sammy Guevara over comments Andrade made relating to some backstage beef the pair had reportedly had back during their feud in March. This uh, it's actually quite old, this beef. No, I'm toast over. Oh. So here's the thing, Andrade had actually been asked about the backstage brawl between Punk and the Elite, but instead said the only issue he had in AEW was with Sammy Guevara, a man whose only real crime as far as AEW fandom was concerned was marrying Ty Conti. The monster. And all the stuff he said about Sasha Banks, of course. Lest we forget. The crux of the matter is that Andrade said Sammy had complained that he had hit him too hard during their matches, saying that even The Miz liked to throw hands more than Sammy. Even The Miz! That is like saying a jellyfish has more spine than you. That's like saying a pretty little dandelion can take a kicking better than you can. That's like saying The Miz is tougher than you! Sammy did not take these comments lying down. Well, 
To be fair, he might have been lying down when he tweeted, calling El Idolo a jobber, a favour hire. Be grateful, bitch. And interestingly, this all came at a time that Andrade had been acting out on Twitter, seemingly angling to get fired so that he could make his way back to WWE. I don't know what you guys, what were you doing? Like, what do you think the what do you think the pipeline is? Like, get fired from WrestleTalk, go to WWE, because it isn't. And anyway, Sammy was giving him exactly what he wanted, a reason to get into a fight. I suppose they're on their way to WWE now. Because verbal sparring became physical combat backstage at Dynamite in Washington DC, as TMZ reported that words were exchanged and then things turned physical, Sammy allegedly pushed Andrade and punches were thrown according to our sources. It's unclear if anyone was hit. I mean, if Sammy was hit, we'd all know about it. He'd still be crying now. What's weird in all of this though is that Andrade was reportedly sent home from the show whereas Sammy worked the main event, teaming with Chris Jericho against Daniel Garcia and Brian Danielson. It was later reported that Andrade and Guevara had been warned about fighting earlier in the evening and security had even been present, but Andrade decided to swing a couple of punches and Sammy did not. I mean, something to prove much. But it did mean that Sammy wasn't sent home while Andrade's AEW future is now up in the air. I mean, it's good to know also that shoot or kayfabe, wrestling security is equally bad. AEW had barely recovered from the fallout from All Out's brawl, and now a new TMZ-worthy drama had rocked them backstage once more. Surely things could only go up from here. Wrestling. Because former AEW world champion hangman Adam Page ended up seriously injured after a bad landing off a lariat had him stretched out with a suspected concussion. At this point, AEW needed to seriously regroup. To come together as a roster. As a band of brothers and sisters. Let the petty squabbles of the past roll off them like so much water from a duck's back. And then spread their waterproofed wings and rise. Rise like a phoenix out of the cloying molasses of Twitter infighting, backstage politicking and knotted contractual posturing. To shine brightly with the fire and fury of a company at the pinnacle. The zenith of professional wrestling. So link arms with me. Be ye merry few, for we all stand together, all as one, equal in knowing that we all deserve grace, we all deserve love, and we all deserve to be scissored by daddy ass. Oh, for f**k's sake. November saw the Elite return to screens following their suspension at Full Gear and having learned their lesson. What's that line? Are oh, the irony alarms on the fritz again. Because while the first match saw the trio on their best behaviour, the second match on Dynamite, in Chicago no less, saw the gang play up to a hostile crowd, borrowing CM Punk's signature taunt, mocking a botch from his feud with Hangman Page, and even hitting his finisher. And we actually have audio of Tony Khan's reaction to the guys doing this on his weekly TV show. For f**k's sake, look at you, look at you, look at what you're f**king doing. You're making this outrageously sh for us. Don't f***ing use his taunt. Don't f***ing mock his botches. I'm trying to make things better. I'm trying to make things better. Why? Why would you do this, you little pricks? You little pricks? You little pricks? But that's not the bit that we should remember, remember about November, as the month also saw AEW pay off on one of their earliest prospects as MJF ascended the greasy pole to become AEW world champion at full gear. And of course, he got his hands dirty while on the way up the pole. My Jeff had William Regal back him up during the main event of Full Gear, sliding him a set of brass knuckles, which he used to donk John Moxley out cold. But Regal's heel turn was quickly followed by an about face as it was revealed in early December that he would be leaving AEW and heading back to WWE now that Papa H was running the show. Which some speculated he had a clause in his contract about. The absolute nutters. It was like if his husband was missing, presumed dead, and after being down on his luck through grief, he finally learned to love again in the arms of someone who valued him. Gave him the freedom to be his weird, goofy self. Gave them beautiful children who he was stunned by their achievements. So extraordinary, were they? Yes, I am talking about the Blackpool Combat Club. And then, you know, the husband just sort of turns up. He didn't die in that canoe accident. He's been living in Sao Paulo or something. Forget the kids, I'm going canoeing. Anyhow, AEW and Regal split on good terms with Big Willie Riggs heading back to a presumed vice president and training position at WWE to be in the company while his son was also there. 
Amicable or not, it was AEW once again being forced to air some dirty laundry, and Willie Riggs' frilly ruffled blouse was taken as a flag of defeat by many of the WWE faithful. But things are never so simple in wrestling, because we can somehow all be losing at the same time, and yet it's also not even a real competition between the two. There is no war in Ba Sing Se. And there is no boss in WWE either, as after Sasha Banks took her ball and went home from Raw in May, rumours suggested she was being lured back by a much bigger ball after new... Uh, referee, Triple H took over. Balls. And then it turned out that what she really wanted was a ball from Japan. Probably because it had a Pokemon in it. The likes of PW Insider and Dave Meltzer said that New Japan Pro Wrestling had said, Sasha Banks, I choose you to appear at Wrestle Kingdom 17 in January 2023 and a number of other dates throughout the year after financial negotiations between herself and WWE were not very effective. So unable to use the Sasha Banks name anymore, the boss needed to rebrand. So she went ahead and trademarked Mercedes Moan. Mercedes Monet, Mercedes money, Moan Monet money problem. I'm, I have no idea how to say that. And that's the year in wrestling, unless of course anything insane happened in the last week like Tony Khan taking Ring of Honor off of AEW television and not being able to get a TV deal. Or Matt Riddle failing a drugs test and being suspended from WWE. Nah, fuck it, I'm not getting into it. Vince did what? Because you wouldn't Adam and Eve it, but during the dying gasps of 2022, Vince McMahon let out one final burst of methane in order to say that he intends to make a comeback to WWE, that he received bad advice about stepping down, and the allegations against him would have blown over had he stayed. Because no woman was gonna get the better of, and you know what comes next, right? Also, this is how far into the arse end of the year this is. I've had to do this bit at home. I've got quality streets. It's Christmas, I've got other things on, Vince. Because this revelation that Vince McMahon wanted to return to the company came from another Wall Street Journal report on WWE, which have historically reflected very well on WWE's chief handsyman, said no one ever. And this one was no different, as it said that the former WWE boss is facing multiple legal demands asserting he sexually assaulted two women, and he is facing a nearly $12 million lawsuit because of it. I feel like Vince is now staring down a hurricane going, don't worry, it'll all blow over. I mean, the major lawsuit comes from WWE's first female referee, Rita Chatterton, who has accused Vince McMahon of sexually assaulting her in the 1990s. McMahon has always denied the allegations. But with all of this floating around, do you really think the WWE really want him to return? Surely they want to move away from this old school misogynistic backstage viewpoint where women are sex objects and unsafe in the work environment from the predations of men. Surely this is why they released Mandy Rose for her protection. Because Rose was let go from the company after they found out that she had been posting lewd photos to her fan time page. Fightful said that WWE officials felt in a tough position over the content and it was outside the parameters of her deal. But the thing is, she may have been posting nipples, but she certainly didn't slip as her lawyer said that she had made $500,000 in the week since her release from the company. I gotta say that I love the fact that WWE were trying to impose their backward standards on independent contractors and it backfired massively here because I mean, the best advert for Mandy Rose's bodily autonomy that you can want. It's just, it's just all, it's all chef's kiss. Oh, and it is a fitting f you to a company still embroiled in a decades old scandal of its scumbag former boss. But it's fair to say that the wrestling landscape has seismically shifted in 2022. A Me Too Tior has wiped out the dinosaurs in WWE and Paul has inherited the earth. But that same crash has caused the fault line crack to open up in AEW and liquid hot heat has begun to pour out. And will 2023 be an explosion or will it be an ice age? A chance to cool off and for wrestling to just calm the f down. Kind of lost the dinosaur theme in there, but I think it's fair to say that in the world of big meaty men slapping meat, 2022 has seen more than its fair share of beef, chicken and ham actors. Now is the time for prime cuts. Do you hear that, you lot? Better get your acts together in 2023. <laughs> 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 I'm not what I deserve. Ow! <laughs>